welcome to Lakeshore Bible Church. My name is Steve Taylor and I'm the church's lead pastor. You can find us online at www.lakeshorebible.net as well as on our church Facebook page. We would also gladly have you visit us in person at our church campus at 6415 South Lakeshore Drive in Tempe, Arizona. At Lakeshore Bible Church, we believe that God has created everyone with unique talents, abilities, and purpose. We hope to point you towards a loving relationship with the God who created you through His Son, Jesus Christ. We also would be delighted to have you involved with our genuine, caring, and supportive church family. As a church, we strive to be three things. We strive to be family-oriented, Bible-based, and kingdom-driven. Worship services are held every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. with young adult, adult, and children's Sunday school classes proceeding at 9.30 a.m. We also host midweek Bible studies every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. A guiding truth for us is bringing kingdom hope to human brokenness as we await kingdom fullness at the return of Christ. We would love to have you join us in that experience. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Lakeshore Bible Church. My name is Steve Taylor and I'm the church's lead pastor. You can find us online at www.lakeshorebible.net as well as on our church Facebook page. We would also gladly have you visit us in person at our church campus at 6415 South Lakeshore Drive in Tempe, Arizona. At Lakeshore Bible Church, we believe that God has created everyone with unique talents, abilities, and purpose. We hope to point you towards a loving relationship with the God who created you through His Son, Jesus Christ. We also would be delighted to have you involved with our genuine, caring, and supportive church family. As a church, we strive to be three things. We strive to be family-oriented, Bible-based, and kingdom-driven. Worship services are held every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. with young adult, adult, and children's Sunday school classes proceeding at 9.30 a.m. We also host midweek Bible studies every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. A guiding truth for us is bringing kingdom hope to human brokenness as we await kingdom fullness at the return of Christ. We would love to have you join us in that experience. Thank you for joining us today.
Thank you, Gene. Remember when I was a young boy watching a piano player? And I thought, this can't be that hard because all they do is move their hands really fast and hit a lot of, of no notes on the keyboard. When I tried it, it didn't come out anywhere near the same as an accomplished musician. So I know there's a lot more to it than that, but we uh, very much appreciate the musical talents of our ladies that share. And uh, so we are, we're thankful for them and leading us and helping us in worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. That sounded like a minute, so that's a, that's a good thing. We welcome you on a more characteristic Arizona day. If you'd have come yesterday, it wouldn't seem much like Arizona. We enjoy the rain whenever we can get it, but it sure doesn't seem like Arizona when we have a day like that. So we're glad to welcome you on a partially sunny day and certainly a day when it is good to be together with the family of God. Amen? Amen. So we welcome you to this time of worship. We're going to call on, uh, well, before we do that, maybe I should share some announcements with you. I usually do that a little later on, but hopefully you got a bulletin on your way in. Let's take a look at just a few announcements, especially on the back page. That seems to be the more urgent uh, announcements on the back side of it. So let's point out a couple things here, and then we'll get into our call to worship in a moment. Uh, first on the list is I'm going to be gone most of next week. It's time for the annual ministerial conference down in Atlanta area. Leaving tomorrow morning, coming back Thursday night. There will be no midweek this week in light of that. This coming Saturday, and we know the weather's going to be good for that. We're going to have a church hike. We try to do this once a year. The information is in your bulletin about where it will be and when it will be. And come prepared. Uh, it will be a fun time. So we look forward to having you join us for that. One week from today, we get to eat again. We're going to have our annual Sunday school picnic. So we're cooking out, we're eating out, we're playing games out. Well, you can play some games in possibly too, and you might even eat inside. I don't know. Anyway, plan to come out and uh, enjoy a recreational time and a, a time of eating after church next Sunday. Men, we get to eat again on March the 7th, another men's breakfast. So there's a sign-up sheet for that. So uh, that will help us in our planning. Uh, I think about three or four people have signed up already. So men, if you're planning to come, we'd love to have you sign up for it and join us that day. One final note, and you'll notice the man with the camera. He's up here in front of you. Chris Kastner has taken on, I, I think, a very important ministry here at Lakeshore, and that is pictures, uh, taking pictures and displaying them on the entryway monitor. You notice if you've been looking at that, so you know the same old pictures are shown every week. Well, not today. He has put all new pictures up today. Next week, you'll have a bunch of different pictures. So it's going to be changing, and we appreciate what Chris is doing. So, by the way, if you have pictures to share with him, we've listed his email address. If you've got pictures of some recent church activities that you'd like to have included, he would be glad to have them. So not only is he taking pictures, he's collecting them. So share those with him. But we, we appreciate that ministry. So... Having said those things, I guess we're not done with announcements, are we, Linda? Absolutely. Sorry I didn't warn you, but I also, uh, the young adults get another chance to eat. On um, next Friday evening, we're having a young adult class party. Um, even if you've never been to our Sunday school class, if you consider yourself a young adult, that means you're out of high school, but you probably aren't, you know, 40 or 50 yet, maybe. Um, anywhere in that range, we're not going to take, you know, card you when you come through or anything. So just come to the Carl Bloom House. Meet, see me after church. I've got a card I can give you with the address and all that information. It starts at 4.30 at Carl Bloom's house next Saturday. I was starting to get my hopes up. The way you described that out of high school and in that 40-ish thing, uh, well, okay, that, that's in my dreams at this point. <laughs> All right, at this, at this time, I'm going to ask you to stand, and Chad York's going to lead us in our call to worship and our opening prayer this morning, and we'll remain standing for our first songs after that. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to head up here so I don't drop my Bible. Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. My name's Chad York, and I have my four boys with me today here, and we, we just feel so blessed uh, to be in the presence of uh, such wonderful and amazing fellowship. Uh, we're called to praise the Lord God at all times, 
Um, all glory be to God the Father our, and our, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I wanted to read today out of the Old Testament, uh, Psalms 34, verse 1 through 4. And this doesn't have the preface. This is a psalm of, of David. It reads, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I'm going to continue on to six. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. I, my intention was just to go through verse four there, but verse six was really the reason why I, I chose chapter 34. Uh, it, re, it reminds me of a time um, I lie prostrate, prostrate alone at home on cold, hot, hardened tile floors, um, crying out to God for truth, wisdom, and discernment, and it just kind of brought me back to that. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, just lead us in prayer, if we could. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your thankfulness, your faithfulness to us, to this church body. We come before you, Father, with thankful hearts that you would count us worthy of your truths. Be with us today, Father, as we worship you, and guide us as we seek truth in your words. Thank you, Father, for sending your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to atone for our sins, for our personal salvation. It is, his, it is in his beautiful name that we pray to you, Father. Amen. Thank you. Let's lift our voices in song this morning as we sing to God be the glory, great things he has done.
seated for a moment. This morning we are introducing a song that is new to our congregation. It is not a new song. I think I saw a copyright of 1989 <laughs> on the song, but it is, a, I think, a timeless and wonderful worship song. In fact, it's called Wonderful, Merciful Savior. It really is a song of praise to our Father for the things that he has done. I'm looking at the lyrics uh, as we are preparing to sing them. A wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, he rescues the souls of men. So it is acknowledging what God has done through his Son. The second verse acknowledges what he is doing through his Spirit in our lives. And the final verse is just acknowledging Almighty, Infinite Father, what a great God that he is. I think it would be helpful if we ask Delina to play it through one time so you can become a bit familiar with it and then join us in singing following that. challenges, but we did very well with that, I think, and uh, we will become more familiar with it in times ahead, and I think that we will be blessed in having that as part of the church. 
sharing in our worship experience. This time I'm going to ask those assisting to come forward. We're going to worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. This is our act of worship in this very practical way. We'll ask them to come forward and we'll ask a blessing as we worship at this time. Father God, we thank you for your abundant blessings upon each of us. We're thankful that we live where we can enjoy many material blessings. We know that those come from your hand. And so, Father, as an act of faith and as an act of reliance upon you, we return a portion into service and in worship, acknowledging, Father, that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Bless us now as we worship and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Is this on? Okay. Sorry, this is a first time for me, so bear with me. The scripture reading this morning is from Exodus 34, verses 1 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flock, flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets, like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning. As the Lord had commanded him, and he had carried the two stone tablets in his hands, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. 
although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm pretty sure most of you, having lived in Arizona, especially in the Phoenix metropolitan area in the summertime, have had a moment when you were parched and needed a drink. Water would be fine. And someone came to your rescue and brought you a cool, refreshing glass of water. There's a proverb that I read this week that I thought fit this so well. It's from Proverbs 25, verse 13 in the message version of the Bible. And it says, reliable friends who do what they say are like cool drinks in sweltering heat, refreshing. Our song today has to do with refreshing water. It draws our attention back to a time when Moses was leading the people in the desert. And they ran out of water in the desert. And they were, of course, complaining to God. And we know this story. God supplied the water out of the rock refreshing water that revived them like a good friend. Paul said that rock was like Christ, the one who brings living water to our lives, nourishes us, strengthens us, and makes us be his people again. The song we're singing is entitled Water from the rock that satisfies. Water from the rock is what I needed. Water from which no one is denied. And when I came to Christ for my salvation, I found Jesus was the rock that satisfied. Wandering endlessly, thirsting endlessly, all I found was bitter water from an earthly stream. How my soul did cry, how I feared to die, everlasting life was just a dream. Water from the rock is what I needed, water from which no one is denied. And when I came to Christ for my salvation, I found Jesus was the rock that satisfied. In this wilderness, earth's dark wilderness, he was smitten with the rock from his father's hand. All my sins did o'er as he suffered more than this human mind could understand. Water from the rock is what I needed. Water from which no one is denied. For my 
salvation. I found Jesus was the rock that satisfied. If you're looking for life with something more, there's refreshing water flowing out from Calvary.
10,000 is a small number. We probably can come up with a, a lot more than 10,000. God is good. All the time. God is good. Amen. We are here this morning celebrating. We've come to worship and to praise and to thank a holy and a great God. God's done great things. There are some things that God has done that not everybody knows, that there are some miracles that have been done in this congregation. And hopefully, not to sound mysterious, hopefully you'll know more in times ahead, but some of us have witnessed God's work in a rather dramatic fashion. Amen. So please open your Bibles this morning as we prepare for our study to John's Gospel, chapter 17. We're not ready to study until we have prayed, so we are going to bow together. Let's look to God in prayer. Father God, we come to rejoice in you today. Oh, you have blessed us abundantly. You are worthy of our praise. We come before you as grateful people this morning. We come to lift our voices in song. We come to be reminded of the truth of your word as we have heard it read. We come to consider a great prayer of our Lord Jesus in a moment. So we come in a spirit of prayer. Father, so often we come into your presence and there are things that we want to ask. Please make this sick person well. Please be with this person who's been injured. Be with this person in a crisis. And we know that you've invited us to bring those cares and concerns before you. But Father, perhaps we spend so little time just basking in your greatness, exalting your name, rejoicing in what you have done for us and in who you are. Father, we have such limited understanding of the one who is infinite in every way. What we do know and what we see, we just are absolutely amazed of. Father, you've revealed much about your character in your word. You have revealed the great things that you have done, and those are not relegated to the past. Those are things, Father, that you are actively at work doing even today. We are thankful for what you, above all, have done through your son, Jesus, the sacrificial death and resurrection and his life at your right hand working on our behalf. Thankful for the comforting presence of Holy Spirit in our lives. A down payment of what is to come. And we rejoice that the best is yet to come. Looking ahead to the coming kingdom, the return of Christ. Seeing him face to face and one day, Father, even being in your presence amazing promises and hope. Thank you for all these things. Father, we pray your special blessing upon our focus on the words of Jesus in Scripture this morning as we look into this passage. We pray you guide us, illuminate us, encourage us, direct us in every way. Let your word accomplish exactly what you desire it to as we open our lives up and yield ourselves to you. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So most of you know that we've been spending the last few weeks looking at the last words of Jesus before his suffering and death. We've been looking in John 14 through 17. We're now getting into chapter 17, the last of all of this. We've looked at his final words to his disciples, and now we turn our attention to, I would say, the greatest prayer ever prayed. If you want to talk about the Lord's Prayer, he gave us a model prayer, but this really is the Lord's Prayer. This is our Lord Jesus' prayer. So we're looking today at this final prayer that he prayed for his disciples, and indeed by extension on down to each of us. He literally prays this prayer for us. 
when we compare Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it talks about the fact that Jesus went off about three times by himself and he prayed while his disciples remained off to themselves sound asleep three times. I guess I kind of wonder where this prayer fits in, and it probably fit in before all of that took place. He prayed this prayer that we see here in John 17. He prayed it in the presence of his disciples, and I guess I would have to believe that after that he went off on his own to pray, and again, the disciples apparently slept while Jesus prayed. But when we focus on this prayer of Jesus, the first thing that comes to my mind is what must it have been like to have heard Jesus pray? It's one thing to look at the words. We're going to look at the words. But the thing I find a little bit frustrating is I just would love to have been able to have been there and heard how these words were prayed and how he prayed to his father. Little wonder the other occasions when the disciples heard him pray to his father, they said, teach us how to pray. They saw a dynamic to the way that he prayed. And they yearned for that. They wanted that. And as I look at this great prayer of Jesus, I'm thinking the same thing. However it is that I pray, Lord, teach me to pray as well. Prayer was such a vital part of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says that during his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. I think that especially applied to this time in his life, the Garden of Gethsemane, praying out with loud cries that he wanted to be saved from that hour. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He wanted another way besides the cross, but yet he was willing to submit to it. And he cried out to the one who could save him from death, and literally God saved him from death. Not preventing death, but he saved him out of death through resurrection. And so he was heard by his father in his prayers. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 says that he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Jesus was a man of prayer. And how blessed his disciples were to hear him pray, to learn from him about prayer. Whenever I think about learning from someone about prayer, I guess it becomes difficult. I've shared this with you before. But in my first pastorate, I had a man who was my prayer mentor. I'm forever indebted to a man by the name of Carl. And I probably have tried to describe to you how it was to be with him when he prayed. I can say that I've never been with anybody who prayed like that man did. When I was together with him, and he made it a point to, as a young pastor to make sure we spent time together nearly every Saturday morning, very early, before he went off to work. But to hear someone like that pray, I, I felt like I shouldn't have been listening to what he was praying. It was like listening to the most personal of conversations. It was kind of like the, the private intimate conversations a husband and wife would have with one another. That's what it was like to be with this man when he prayed. So when I think about how that impacted me, what would it have been like, to come back to this again, what would it have been like to have been the disciples there listening to Jesus pray to his heavenly Father? What an amazing, life-changing experience that must have been. So looking at the words of Jesus, the content of his prayer, three different words, and I've listed those on your outline, three different words that can summarize the main parts of what he prayed. And again, the frustrating part is we don't know the, the emotion, the feeling associated with it, but we have the content of it. Verses 1 to 5. The word glory is a good word to summarize the essence of what he's praying. Talking about glory for the Father, glory with the Father. Verses 6 to 19, perhaps the bulk of the prayer. The word kept is a good word to describe that section because he's talking about keeping the disciples. He's about to leave them. They've been with him for three and a half years. And he's fervently praying to his Father to keep those faithful disciples. Verses 20 to 26, the word one is a good word to describe that. 
And that's probably the most personal section of all for us. We're not looking at that today. We'll look at that next week. But he's talking about oneness for us as the disciples today, the body of Christ, that we all might be one with each other. So you may want to kind of hang those words on a hook as we go and look at the content of his prayer. So we look in the first five verses, and it says, Jesus spoke these things, talking about the words, the final instructions he's just given to his disciples. He spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus lifts his eyes to heaven. He prays to his Father, and he says, Father, the hour has come. We understand about the hour. It is the hour of the greatest trial and difficulty of his life. It is the hour of his suffering and the hour of his death. It is an interesting contrast to what we read at the very beginning of John's gospel. John chapter 2 verse 4 tells us that there was a wedding that Jesus had attended with his mother. And the wine had run out. And apparently mom wants Jesus to do something. She hadn't specified what it is she wants him to do, but she's calling upon him knowing his capabilities, and his comment there is, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But here in this final prayer, he says, the hour has come. I think of Mark's account of his life, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 15, where Jesus began his ministry, and he said, the time is fulfilled. Or we might put in the phrase, the hour has come. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The hour has come. The hour has not yet come. The hour is at hand to believe the message. Timing, I believe, is everything. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 tells us that. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. More than anyone else, Jesus knew when the time was and when the time wasn't. He knew when the appropriate hour was and when it was not. And I guess it comes down to us to consider in our own lives right now in this moment, what time is it for you now? And I don't mean the time on your watch or on the clock. What season of life are you in right now? What is the appropriateness of this hour? What are you called to do and to be? at this particular time. For Jesus, he knew that the time had come. The hour was at hand to glorify God through his sacrificial death. And Jesus, as he prays to his Father, says that God has given him authority over all flesh. He recognizes the fact that God has empowered him with all authority over every living being. After his resurrection, before he ascended to the right hand of his father as he gave what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18, he began by prefacing it saying that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Indeed, that's a, a precious, important truth that we lift up. We believe that Jesus indeed does have all authority over every human being in every age, and that's why we lift up the important message that we're reminded of on the stained glass every week, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by him. All authority over all flesh is entrusted to him, and that's why we feel an urgency to share the gospel message. Because whether people acknowledge it or not, they are under the authority of Jesus and they will give an accounting of their life one day before him. 
Better to give it on good terms, isn't it? Jesus is Lord, rather than grudgingly saying in your disobedience, yeah, he's Lord as you're on your way to be destroyed in the lake of fire. No, we'd much, much rather acknowledge his authority. As a body of believers, we are here to do that. We freely say Jesus is Lord. He has authority, and I have willingly given myself to him and submitted to his authority. So Jesus has authority over all flesh, and as he says in verse 2, that he may give eternal life. God has entrusted him to give eternal life, and he states in verse 3, if you have not highlighted verse 3 in your Bible, you've got to do that, because verse 3 is a monumentally important verse. Notice what he is saying. This is eternal life. Are you interested in eternal life? Do you want eternal life? If so, you need to look at his working definition of it and notice what it is that he says as he prays to his Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Eternal life is bound up in knowing the only true God. This verse does not have to be complicated. Sadly, Christian tradition has, has really made it complicated, but I think if you hand that verse to a child, they'll give you the answer as to what Jesus is saying. What's Jesus doing? He's praying to his Father. What does he say about his Father? This is eternal life, that they may know you, God, my Father. This is eternal life to know you and also to know me, Jesus Christ. He's not praying to himself. He's not talking to himself. We understand that. We get that. And it's important that we do because this is eternal life. The word know is a very, very important word in this verse. To know the only true God and to know Jesus Christ, it is not just to get the facts straight as important as that is. It's not just getting it straight in your head, it's getting it in your heart, it, it's getting it into all of your being. Because the word know means to know by experience, to know by observation. And in fact, to use imagery that's found in the Old Testament, the word no is used of sexual relations between a husband and a wife. The most intimate of knowledge, that's the word that's used here. The most intimate knowledge of your Creator Father. The most intimate knowledge of Jesus, His Son. And so to know in an experiential way in the very depths of your being. Do we get that? That's what it means to have eternal life is that we have that kind of knowledge of our Creator and His Son. I'm thinking that the Apostle Paul lined up with that. That was his goal in terms of Jesus in particular, Philippians 3, 8. When Paul says, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He wanted that perfect experiential kind of knowledge. There's a world of difference here. There's, we don't want to make the mistake of knowing about God our Father and knowing about Jesus Christ. That's not what he's saying. First-hand, personal, experiential knowledge of both is essential to eternal life. Verse 4 in his prayer, Jesus talks about the fact that he has been faithful to glorify God by doing everything that God had commissioned him to do during his earthly ministry. So now he comes to the great trial of his life, now through his death. He says he wants to be glorified together with God in the glory that God had given him before the world was. When he prays a thing like that, is he saying that he existed before the world was? If we walk away with that, we have misunderstood what it is that he's saying. God had glorified him long before he was ever born, and we can say the same for us. God has glorified us long before we were ever born. Ephesians 1, verse 4, is a verse that helps us with that because it says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So the same thing can be said for us. 
We want that glory that always existed before the world was. We want that. It's going to come in resurrection at the return of Christ in the kingdom of God. Jesus is praying the same thing. God always had a glory for him long centuries before he was ever born. He says, I want that full glory now through what my sacrifice and ultimately resurrection and the exalted position that you have for me. And so that's what Jesus prays in those words. We pick up verse 6 of his prayer. And again, I just have to come back to remembering this is a prayer. This is a conversation with his father. We have to keep that in mind as we look at these verses. Praying to his father, he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. As I said a few moments ago, the key word out of these verses, out of this part of his prayer, is the word kept or keep. Jesus says, I have manifested your name. I have revealed your name to these disciples. There's more to the name than might meet the eye. There is the personal name of his father that we understand to be the I am, Yahweh, but in the original language, when he talks about revealing the name of his father to his disciples, it's more than just that personal name, as important as that is. It's revealing the entire being of that individual. And so, in essence, what he says is, I have revealed everything about you, God, whose name is Yahweh. I have revealed that to your disciples. And as he prays, his disciples have come to understand who Jesus is, that God has sent him into the world. And so now he asks of his father to keep them, he says, in your name. And in essence, he says, preserve them, father, by your very being. He says, I'm not asking for the world, but I'm asking for these precious disciples who are about to be left in a cruel, harsh, and a persecuting world. And he says, I want these men to have the same oneness Father, that I enjoy with you. Jesus wants his disciples to have a oneness as Jesus has a oneness with his Father, and that should be self-explanatory, and I think that perhaps we do understand what it is that he's asking and praying. I think that verse 9 is a verse that can become very, very personal for us in his prayer. He's asking for his disciples, but if you want to make it very personal, you might word it this way and put your own name in there. So for myself, I would take his words and say he's praying, I ask for Steve, and I do not ask on behalf of the world, but for Steve, whom you've given me, for he is yours. Put your name in there, because I believe that Jesus at the right hand of God, actively interceding for us, is doing that very thing. You can put your name in there. And know that that is what Jesus is praying for you. He is asking of the Father on behalf of you by name. He's not asking for the world because the world is not in harmony with him or his Father. But we who are in this world, he's praying on behalf of each one of us. How very, very encouraging that is. So Jesus is praying that his disciples be kept even though they're just about to be scattered in very short order. As Jesus is arrested and tried, they're going to run a different direction. They're going to turn away from him. But he prays that they all be kept. He says, except that one, Judas, who had made a deliberate choice and was not able to be kept. 
that's as far as we're going to go this morning with this great prayer because that's plenty for us to try to absorb in our lives and to try to comprehend and, and appreciate. I want to go back to those two words that I mentioned at the start that summarize this part of his prayer, the word glory and the word kept. I think those are important words for us to be focused on as we consider these verses and this prayer this morning, Philippians 2. Verses 5 and 6 that tells us and challenges us to make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his advantage. That focuses on that word glory. The priority of Jesus was the glory of his Father. He literally lived and died for the glory of his Father. So if we want to bring this on down to our own lives I think we need to ask this question, how willing am I to make God's glory my priority? And I think that's a good searching question for us to consider as we look at the example of Jesus our Lord, who chose to be a servant, to faithfully follow his Father, and to bring glory not to himself, but glory to his Heavenly Father. I feel a tinge of guilt as I think about that because I think about my own reputation. I think about my own status way too much. If I see the example of Jesus here, apparently he did not make that a priority. He chose to empty himself rather than to build himself up in his reputation and so forth. And so it's so very easy for us to look at what we can gain rather than how we can empty ourselves in the form of a servant to bring glory to God. That's the priority, but that is certainly not natural, and it is not easy. I mentioned the word kept from verses 6 to 9. That word is especially encouraging. Jesus had kept his disciples for three and a half years while he was actively with them. But now things were about to change. But even as Jesus would leave the earthly scene, he was not about to turn them loose and let them go their own way and fend for themselves. He was still going to keep them. and In fact, in a more powerful way, he was going to keep them through the spirit that would represent his presence with them. And so that's how he would keep them. Now, granted, they were going to fall even that very night, but they would not ultimately fail totally in the whole scheme of things. They would stumble but they would be kept in Jesus. And the same can be said for us. We will stumble, and there are times when we are going to stumble badly and have done so. But we will stumble, but we will never fall in the truest sense of the word because Jesus, as he's praying, is keeping us as well. That's what he's doing at his Father's right hand right now is keeping us in him. And we need that desperately because we can't do it ourselves. And so Jesus is working to keep us even as he was keeping his disciples. He keeps us. He is glorified in and through us. And he is actively seeking to bring oneness with one another as he enjoys oneness with his Father. It reminds me in Ephesians 4, the first three verses, the Apostle Paul says, I, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. Paul wanted the same thing, apparently. Jesus says, I want you in oneness. I'm going to actively work to, to bring you into oneness. And so that's been promised to us, but as Paul says, we need to diligently keep that unity of the Spirit. We need to be working ever toward oneness. It's a wonderful thing to be part of a church body that enjoys great unity and harmony. We can never, ever take it for granted. The silliest thing, seemingly, can divide members of the body of Christ. And so we are entrusted with guarding and preserving the unity of the Spirit. It is good that we have it. Let's make sure that we keep that and appropriate the prayers and the help of Jesus that we might enjoy oneness as well. More than anything else, as I think about the prayer of Jesus that we look at here, it is a huge encouragement to know that Jesus, even now, is praying for us at the right hand of his Father. Hebrews 7, verse 25 says that he always lives to make intercession for them. 
for us. Do we get that? He's at the right hand of our Father. Always living. The life that he lives now is to make intercession for us, to help us in our weakness, to give us that which we need that God our Father can supply. So Jesus knows that we need and want to glorify God as he did. He knows that we need and want to be kept. He knows that we need and want to be in oneness with one another and with him and with our Father. And indeed, he is actively working on our behalf for all of those things. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your active work on our behalf. Father God, I thank you for these inspired, authoritative words of Jesus. His prayer, a heartfelt prayer, prayed in the presence of the disciples for their benefit and for ours. And now we know that that's the active work of him at your right hand. Even now as we pray, we're coming through him. Lord Jesus, we value and appreciate your great work. You know how weak and helpless we are, how desperately we need that help. You have not forsaken us. You have not left us alone. You've not left us as orphans. You're with us and you're working for us. We give you thanks for that. Father, we thank you for the abundant resources that you lavish upon us through him. We enjoy the greatness of your riches in Christ. We celebrate that. And we thank you that we can be reminded of that. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name through you. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we close our service this morning. And we think about the many things that Steve has shared that God has placed on his heart this morning. The greatest thing. appropriate. We mentioned it a little bit ago, acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. I think we can do this a cappella. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Let's sing that.
that we freely confess, don't we? Amen. So I leave you with this blessing out of Numbers chapter 6 this morning. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. sickness, are we? <laughs>